Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for this opportunity. Um, so I'll be talking about the role of transposable element in stress response adaptation, somewhat a little different from what we have talked about. So a um, couple of days back, I gave sort of a you know, small talk on, on transposable element that was sort of intended to have a, a background in slash introductions. So I'll give you a two minute snapshot of what I have talked about very quickly. So this was the titles. And the transposable element was discovered by uh, Dr. McLean Talk on the colon. And I, I was explaining how there was a working, and this is the coin that is having this particular transposon. And th there are three different types of transposon depending on how that, uh, how that replicate. So there's RNA transposon and DNA transposon. I'm sure a lot of you knows this. I'll pass this. <laughs> And I was talking about the transposon is a major component in the genome. Some species has more than 50%. In case of human, we have a 45% of genome that, that has about, uh, that has transposon everywhere. And um, because transposon causes genome instability, a lot of times the, the, the plants or animal wants to have that, that, that them to be very, very suppressed. So this is one of the well-known components uh, the uh, well-known mechanism to suppress transposable element. And I was explaining that this is called LDDM. And we'll get to the point a little later on some of the uh, component goals, for instance, DCL3 or other components that will be talked about. And I was also talking about epigenetics. And epigenetic is, is the study that, uh, that uh, study of cellular trait variation uh, comes with some uh, phenotypic change without DNA sequence change that is epigenetics. There are uh, many other, uh, many components that is known to affect uh, epigenetic change. Uh, for instance, chromatin remodeling, histone, and DNA methylation. Um, so, so here's uh, chromatin remodeling will, will, uh, will change the compaction of a histone, compaction of chromatin, so that the accessibility will be different. And uh, histone and DNA are main component of chromatins. And in some cases, if you modify this, then that will change the property of the chromatins. And I was talking about the environment sometimes uh, uh, give a st stress response, and this stress response will alter epigenetic status, and perhaps this is one of the ways we can get to the adaptations. And here is the, uh, the, the slide that I used. And um, uh, surprisingly, there are lots of uh, uh, big phenotypic change that it is triggered by epigenetic change. So actually, I took this uh, one of example where the aphid that is exposed to a uh, predator, they sometimes have winged aphid children in the f following generations. But this actually uh, mediated by epigenetics, not by the genetics. So this is showing that the epige epigenetic change sometimes uh, triggered by the stress, and that will give a very, uh, re a very visible <laughs> phenotype. So I was explaining that the transposable element, to the contrary of most belief, that trans transposable elements sometimes have transcriptionally active, and particularly become um, much more apparent if you mix with, uh, 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 mix with the stress and together with some of the epigenetic mutations. So you can clearly see here one of the uh, transposable elements uh, named copia getting uh, very active uh, when the pseudomonas being uh, uh, treated where on the well-known epigenetic mutant. And here I looked, we are looked at uh, trans, uh, the transcriptome of Arabidopsis, and there are uh, hundreds of hundreds uh, of uh, transposable elements transcription active even without stress. And if you check with the stress, then you will see that this, uh, the trans, uh, transcription of transposable element uh, significantly increases. And not only that, it become uh, transposably active, meaning that it will move the location. We can clearly see here each single band indication uh, indicating the position of transposable element. This one actually increase if you add uh, pathogen in, uh, infections. And not only that, it will have a, a, a inheritability, so we actually uh, in, uh, they infect the uh, uh, plants with the pathogen uh, multiple generations. We found that it is being uh, kept in 
the genome. So not only that it is, it is transposed, that transposant appears to be inherited uh, to the uh, uh, following generations. So that was sort of uh, the, the background that I provided. And I, I was proposing the possibility that perhaps, um, perhaps having a transposable element sensing the stress, and this transposable element is mediating the environmental stress and uh, genetic change. Because uh, if you move the transposable element, there will be genetic change after all. So here, in the main talk, I'll be talking about some of the stuff that we found with the transposable element, particularly in terms of, uh, in terms of different genes, uh, stress responses, and potentially adaptations. So in the previous uh, 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 seminar, uh, two senior sensei gave a really nice uh, description of PTI and ETI, so that I won't have to uh, uh, spend time on this. So essentially, PTI will recognize the foreign molecules and it will trigger immune responses. ETI is now in, within the cell, you, you already have a factor from the pathogen, so it, this one signify this is really a grave, a grave uh, situation, therefore, this ETI tends to be really strong and vigorous responses. A lot of times, this PTI and ETI, the, the difference is kinetics and the magnitudes. So here, you're looking at three different uh, um, three different potato cultivar infected with the same pathogens. And here, resistance uh, phenotype and the susceptible phenotype, the difference maker is only one gene, one gene that is our gene. And this is a typical example of how ETI can be uh, effective. So, when I started my research program uh, back in uh, 2012, a lot of study done on epigenetics, but except one uh, characteristic, chromatin remodeling. So we, we decided to look at the, how the chromatin change in response to, uh, in response to pathogen infections. So to be able to do so, we decided to do uh, the technique called DNA is one sick. The, the way it works is you actually uh, purify the nucleus and treat it with some of the DNA, uh, DNA uh, di digestion uh, digesting enzyme, in this case, we use a DNA is one, and any open chromatin that has uh, access to DNA is one will get, get cut, and you have a liberating DNA, and this is the one that you, you sequence using next gen sequencer. So here's one of the example, wild type and wild type uh, treated with AVL, uh, wild type treated with virulence. And AVLUNS uh, passion generally trigger ETI, effective trigger immunity, and uh, virulence will trigger PTI plus basal re uh, resistance. So, so we, are, we are very interested in looking at the area where the genome accessibility will be poor when the mark was treated. So this is a control experiment. And if you treat it with the pathogen, there will be increase of accessibility of that particular area. That's the one that we are interested in. So we actually characterize uh, several combinations, but today I'm go only going to talk, to talk about wild type. MOC12 and MOC126 is one of the epigenetic mutations, which I'll be uh, talking about briefly, but I'm not going to talk about much about it. So when we look at the area that changed the accessibility in response to uh, uh, avirulent or virulent pathogen, we mainly found that the, uh, the gene that is associated with the stress and abiotic biotic stress was uh, over, uh, overly represented, which was uh, sort of uh, expected. So one example is here, the gene that is called PL1, these are very well characterized uh, marker genes in Arabidopsis. Here you can see that the promoter area you can see the mark versus pseudomonas treated. There is actually a differential accessibility to the chromatin. So that's sort of expected. But what is unexpected was the, this another area that seems to be following that, uh, that pattern, but only the stuff that was presented was a transposable element. So we decided to look at what, ha what would happen if we actually uh, uh, silence this particular area. Is it going to affect this PL gene uh, inductions? So here we designed the uh, hairpin loop uh, uh, construct and then make it transgenic and look at the, how the PL1 behaved. So PL1 uh, will behave like this in the wild type background. So the mark treated, uh, mark treated, and then here's a PL1 
will be induced in response to pseudomonas in the wild type background. And when we, when we generated a hairpin loop uh, targeting this particular transposable element, we found that this inducibility, inducibility significantly dropped, suggesting that this is actually, this area is unknown enhancer area that is associated with the transposable element, nonetheless is, is affecting the PL1. So we decided to look at further. So before we go into that, uh, we found that, for instance, here, wild type versus Mark 1, 2. I told you this is one of the epigenetic mutations. What we have found was a lot of time epigenetic mutant will delay this induction of this different genes. So here we can see that by 24 hours, PL1 will, uh, will peak and come down. And if you're looking at here, this mutant background, this northern blot, PL1 goes actually up, and by the 48 hour, it, be it begins uh, peaking and coming down. So the, so the overall amount, you don't look, it, they don't look like the, that much different, but only the difference is the when it peaks. So wild type is actually peaking it earlier, and uh, in the mutant background, it's peaking a little, little later. And that was also the ca case with PL2 and PL5. So um, let me just skip this one. It's just show that a lot, lot more uh, different gene that has a TE associated DDHS. DDHS is differentially accessed chromatin area in response to infections. They tend to have a less vigorous defense genes inductions. So here we again targeted the area that is, that is only the T, not in the promoter, and trying to see if there is any impact. So here we have a PL1, which I already have shown you. And there's a one, two, three, four more area that we have tested. In this case, what is common there is actually this particular protein, MOC1, was associated with that particular area. It turns out this MOC1 protein is, is uh, interacting with the transposable element preferentially. So we found that a lot of times this is not as uh, big as a PL1, but nonetheless there's a substantial difference in, in all cases except this. So, um, so here we, we, we begin to think that perhaps epigenetic components are important in regulating defense gene induction kinetics. So we decide to look at other type of epigenetics uh, components. So I will be introducing one of the projects that is involving with the DCL in Arabidopsis because DCL, there's only four in Arabidopsis. So we decide to look at that uh, particular, uh, uh, particular set. So when we're trying to analyze kinetics of different gene, we were trying to look for some RNA-seq data set, but we were, not find, we were not able to find a good data set. So we decided to look at the, uh, we decided to do the uh, MRNA-seq by ourselves. So here's the MRNA-seq data set, and this is a, a setup, five time points and three different, uh, uh, three different treatment, avirulent uh, looking at ETI, and virulent pathogen and mock controls, and we had a three biological replicate. This actually turns out to be very important because there are actually set that only have a, a duplicate. It, it's very difficult to do a statistical analysis with a uh, duplicate. So uh, when we uh, finish it, what we have asked was, what is the kinetic uh, induction pattern that we can see from this? So uh, the computer algorithm actually uh, spits out uh, nine different uh, cluster of different genes, one through nine. And this is a little bit busy, so if I move to another one, this is a little, little bit simpler. This is eigen gene analysis. So cluster three is a typical early different genes. So it's peaking at six hours and coming down rapidly. So, so here's a, the blue, uh, the red line is avalanche uh, uh, pathogens in, uh, infections. So this is it will trigger ETI. And in contrast, if you're looking at the V, which is a virulent pathogen, it's actually slower. Now, if you look at uh, late defense genes, it will peaking at the 24 hours instead of the six hours. You can see that it will go a little late, but nonetheless it's coming down again. But if you're looking at the uh, virulent pathogen, it will continue to climb. That's a, a distinction between the early defense gene and late defense genes. So here we looked at what will be the distance. So the, I already presented to you, uh, we have uh, about uh, 300, 400 uh, DDHS, the chromatin area that is open up and closed in response to infections. What will be the distance to this defense gene, the one through nine cluster? And the, the, the closest one that we found was all these defense genes. And the, the second one was 
that is close to 2 and close to 6. So we decided to further investigate whether or not this is, has anything to do uh, with differential inductions. So here I'm going to introduce a DC, four DCL components. This is the component that produces small RNA. In our opposite, there are four. And a main, main, uh, a main type of small RNA is 20 through 24. And DCL1 is generally involved in producing MR, uh, microRNA. And DCL3, for instance, will produce mainly 24 uh, of four nucleotide small RNA. And this is very important in suppressing transposable elements. So we decided to look at it, but by the time we decided to look at the transgenic uh, uh, transcriptome of this uh, mutant, there seems to be too many samples. So we decided to look at a uh, more efficient way of doing it. So the way we do, uh, did it was using uh, using another tools. But before we go into that, we also decided to look at what is the resistance in this uh, uh, mutant background. So here is a Columbia zero wild type DCL one, two, three, four. And LPH2 as a, as a control. And this uh, particular panel is showing ETI, and this one is showing the basal resistance. Basal resistance, we were not able to see much different. In, in fact, in the DCL7, it gets uh, more resistant for unknown reason. If you look at ETI, it was clearly that the DCL1, 1 7 show compromised response to uh, these avian pathogens. So DCL1 was a little higher. So essentially, we are looking at you know, how fast this pseudomonas is growing. You can see that in, in this case, as compared to Columbia 0, DCL1 support much more pseudomonas growth. And DCL4 actually also shows some, some change uh, uh, as compared to wild type background. So we clearly know, particularly for ETI, DCL uh, component appears to be involved. So we decided to look at the transcriptome. So uh, this is a tool called Russell seq And what, it, what it's using is if you have RNA, this RNA will facilitate the uh, probe that we designed. So for instance, primer 1, primer 2. So if you have RNA, that, will, that primer will bind to the uh, RNA molecules. This will allow the ligase to ligate these uh, primers. And then that is going to be the one that's going to be sequenced. So this is essentially targeted massive uh, uh, RNA seq. So that's what we have used. So um, here we have used the same setup, except the fact that we now introduce more genetic background in, in addition to wild type and 4D shell mutant. Um, 237 gene is being, has been tested, including about 150 pseudomonas inducible genes. And uh, we only have read uh, 50 million, so that's how effective that is can be. Because if you run just regular Illumina sequence, and that's, that will generate about 20, 50 millions. You only need about uh, 50 million readout uh, for just uh, doing this analysis. Okay. So um, this is sort of the snapshot of the early definition. So I'm only going to show you uh, uh, early definition today. We can, if you're looking at wild type and virulence, you can see that by six hours, this is, here's a six hour in the center, most of the gene is peaking at uh, six hours and coming down. That shows that, uh, that this one seems to be working. If you're looking at DCL1, uh, the, this peak is actually changed a bit. But to be able to better show this, actually, if you move to the second, the next, uh, next slide, this is just show that the difference between DCL and the wild type. We can see that here, DCL1 avirulence, uh, six hours, there is a lot, there is a substantial amount of number of genes that are actually going lower than wild type. That means that as compared to wild type, DCL1 has compromised inductions in response to these avirulent pathogens. DCL4 actually showed somewhat different, uh, somewhat uh, similar response to DCL1, but actually uh, much uh, subdued uh, change. DCL2 and DCL3 actually going opposite directions. In fact, it actually induced better than wild type. A lot of, uh, for a lot of, uh, lot of genes. So here, um, DCL mutant led to differential inductions. So um, we actually try to look at, hey, then uh, let's look at the location of this gene that is being tested. Euchromatin, uh, faculty, uh, facultative heterochromatin, heterochromatin, the distinction is if the gene is close to centromere 
we, uh, uh, we assign that as uh, heterochromatins. If it's a little far away, then we, put, we set a faculty of heterochromatins. And if it's a far away, then we, we put it as a euchromatins. You can clearly see from here, DCL1, the, the gene that is massively induced in wild-type background, you can see that they are induced. And now I think we are looking at six hours, avian pathogen. And they are massively in, uh, increased, but they are all uh, uh, fall into a faculty of heterochromatin. So it's in between euchromatin and heterochromatins. And those are the ones actually also show the difference in DCL1 as well, although there are a lot of exceptions. So um, if, I, if I include everything, the, I cannot cut the statistical uh, cut. But nonetheless, there are a group of the genes that are located in the faculty of heterochromatins that has massive inductions, but DCL1 seems to be required. And if you look at DCL2, it's going opposite directions. And DCL4 actually resembles uh, to the DCL1. So there is something common between uh, DCL1 and 4, and there's uh, something in common in, in DCL2 and 3. Oops. So as I uh, introduced earlier, the DCL1 is important in producing small RNA. And uh, we do not have a small RNA uh, seq data set yet corresponds to what we have because we are looking at a distinct uh, uh, our point. But we were able to get a, a small RNA data set from Dr. Classic looking at four hours, relatively uh, early time point, but unfortunately utilizing the pseudomonas, virulent pseudomonas. We also analyzed uh, Halim genes uh, 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 groups, uh, small RNA data set, but unfortunately the uh, time point is somewhat different. But nonetheless, we actually find a very similar pattern. That was. Um, here, we, I'm only showing you 21 nucleotide small RNA and small, uh, 24 nucleotide small RNA. Because 24 is mainly being produced by DCL4. And uh, the DCL1 is also known to contributing uh, much more to the uh, 21, although I think that distinction seems to be a little bit, little bit blurry this, uh, this day. What we saw was here's the small, uh, small, uh, here is a DCL1 wild type uh, difference. So if you have a dot that is lower, that means um, in the DCL1 background, the expression level is lower. And in that case, we saw a lot of cases that small, that small RNA has a massive change when, when they compare the wild type background pseudomonas versus mock, uh, uh, mock treatment, meaning that this small RNA uh, molecule that has a sequence homology to that area has a big change in response to pseudomonas uh, uh, treatment. That was also the case with the 24 nucleotide small RNA. And uh, DCL, in, in case of DCL4, again, that actually going, uh, that actually has the same, same distributions. This small RNA appears to be changing, uh, uh, changing uh, to at the substantial portions. And if you look at 24 and 21, that was a, a, a similar pattern. So I'm actually uh, showing you some of the housekeeping gene that we utilize. Uh, in contrast to the different gene that I just showed you, if I go back, this one is showing a very uh, uh, distinct pattern where the small RNA seems to be altering in, the, in their amount. If, I, if you're looking at this housekeeping gene, except for one outlier, they tend to stay in the middle, meaning the small RNA population doesn't change much. Okay. So suggesting that the small RNA change appears to be only limited to the different genes that is altering uh, uh, very much, and particularly the one that is changing in the DCL1, uh, uh, DCL1 and DCL4. So we asked then, is it, going, is it limited to the gene that is being expressed? Because obviously, if you have a gene that is active, and that's where this small RNA sometimes can be generated. And we also ask whether or not this DDHS that we have identified, infection-induced DDHS, does that produce small RNA in the particular locus? And we actually looked at it and see um, if there's any overlap. And here is the y-axis essentially looking at the difference between wild-type treated with the pseudomonas and wild-type treated with a mark control. And if you have a dot over here, that means you have a small, small RNA 
more present in response to pseudomonas as compared to mouth control. And we are looking at 21, 22, 23, 24. And um, uh, bottom line was there are lots of the uh, DDHS that has increased more in the population in response to pseudomonas. Obviously, this is, uh, uh, this is only the in silico analysis. So we are currently looking at whether or not this is real by looking at the, no, the, the small and the northern block. So um, here I'd like to summarize what I have told you. Um, many transposable element appears to be stress responsive transcriptionally and uh, transpositionally. Okay? And, and transposable element was were found in DDHS. The, the chromatin area seems to change the uh, accessibility. They are associated with the different genes. And some of the epigenetic components are involved in the induction of different genes. And it remains to be seen what role these transposable elements play in the evolution of stress inducible gene. The reason why we are interested is if we imagine that this transposable uh, can jump into the um, potential different gene, is it going to change their neighboring, uh, dif uh, neighboring potential gene by having that being inserted? That's the reason why we want to do this one. And that as of now, we, we try to actually create a condition where a transposable element will be inserted itself. And then we're now analyzing the neighboring gene and see if the, uh, if the, uh, the, the gene induction pattern will change. So these are, uh, these are the my group, relatively small. Um, I actually talked about most, uh, most of uh, uh, Yogi's, da uh, Yogi's data today. Uh, uh, he is a PhD candidate. Uh, about to graduate. Ji Chao is working on epigenetic uh, regulator. Song Yil is a postdoc working on transposome biology. And uh, Nicole actually uh, just graduated and uh, she, she's been doing a lot of genome editing. And Lars and me have been uh, doing a lot of bioinformatics. And these are the group of people who uh, has helped us uh, uh, through the collaborations. And this is the funding source. Thank you very much. <laughs>